Well, if there's one thing that humans need, I would say that resurrection tops the list. Hey, everybody, welcome to SJC's online worship experience. So excited you're with us today. If you're new, if it's your first time, we want to welcome you. You're in the right spot. We continue our message series through the Lenten season. It's called Human. Today, we're going to be in John 11, and we're going to be looking at the epic story, the sign of Jesus's glory in the raising of Lazarus from the dead. It's going to be a powerful time of prayer, worship, time in God's word. So let's get ready to do it, everybody. Almighty God, to you, all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you, no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen.
A reading from John. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was ill, so the sisters sent a message to Jesus. Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness does not lead to death, rather it is for God's glory, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, after having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, Let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now trying to stone you. And are you going there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours of daylight? Those who walk during the day do not stumble, because they see the light of this world. But those who walk at night stumble, because the light is not in them. After saying this, he told them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he fought, has fallen asleep, he will be all right. Jesus, however, had been speaking about his death, but they thought that he was referring merely to sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake, I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go, that way that we may die with him. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, so two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him. While Mary stayed at home, Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. When she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, The teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. The Jews who were with her in the house consoling her saw Mary get up quickly and go out. They followed her because they thought that she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, See how he loved him? But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench because there has been... He has been dead for days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth, and his face wrapped in cloth. Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had came with Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him.
the word of the Lord. Well, hey, everybody, there's no greater indicator of the precious nature of the gift of life than the human grief over the reality of death. We don't always value the lives of others the way we should, but the sting of death is a stark reminder that we were created to live and to flourish in that living. And of course, we don't like to think about it, especially publicly, but the truth is that the subject of death dominates our thoughts. Every day we're faced with its reality. We may focus ourselves on the business of living. We're all living our best lives, as the saying goes, and living as well as we can, but we can never quite jettison the trailing shadow of death. It's our human situation, as we've been learning through the season of Lent, and it's our human preoccupation. Through this Lenten season, we've been looking at different dimensions of the human situation in God's creation, human identity as the Imago Dei, human longing and hope, human suffering and need, human inquiry and the existential quest. We've looked at the human bruising through sin and death and our human deficiency through participation in the order of sin and death. And through all of these, we've explored how our very certain human realities, our guilt and shame among them, has been overmatched uh, or matched and overwhelmed, I should say, by a God-given reality that we call the gospel, the good news. And how this reality, whose ultimate relevancy and clarity we see through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, comes to us in the most counterintuitive way. God solves the human challenge of sin and death by becoming human himself, and not a robot human, uh, not a human insulated from the grid and grime of a weary world, not a privileged human with special status uh, that works its way around certain situations in life, but a human of humble station, and yet a human like no other, a human upon whom the Holy Spirit rests, Jesus the Son of God. John's gospel is crafted that we might see the glory of God through the person of Jesus and believe in his redeeming accomplishment. Toward the end of John's gospel, he proclaims with these words, quote, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name, close quote. The these for John is a general reference to his entire gospel account, but particularly of the seven public signs of Jesus's glory told throughout the gospel, beginning with his first miracle of turning water into wine at the wedding feast in Cana of Galilee. The seventh sign is our passage today in John 11, the raising of Lazarus. It's a culmination, it's a representative sign of what humans need most of all, which is resurrection and life. Jesus' friend, Lazarus, has fallen ill. Lazarus is the brother of Martha and Mary, with whom we read about in various places in the Gospels. They are close friends with Jesus and his disciples. They live in the village Bethany in Judea, just some two miles or so outside of Jerusalem. It's an area where Jesus' ministry is most sharply contested by the Pharisees. When Jesus gets the news, he proclaims to his disciples that this will not lead to death, but it's for the glory of God, so that the Son of God is glorified through it. He waits then two more days. The disciples are somewhat confused when Jesus implies that Lazarus is only sleeping, a euphemism for death. When Jesus suggests that they finally make their way to Bethany, the disciples understand the danger, but they could hardly anticipate the sign of glory that was about to unfold. And they're not alone. We can hardly fathom what took place that day. The resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, if true, is the pivotal event upon which human hope rests and finds its confidence, which is why the gospel accounts and the other writings of the New Testament make the cross of Christ the central claim of the Christian faith. Now, this resurrection before the resurrection, this resurrection of Lazarus, though not a final resurrection, well, it becomes the sign of Jesus's ultimate victory over death that he would uh, accomplish on Calvary uh, just a short time later. As Jesus arrives near Bethany, Martha meets him saying, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. 
Jesus famously says to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. Martha recognized Jesus as a prophet who could heal, of course, but never expected Jesus to be the Lord who could raise the dead. She concedes that, yes, according to Jewish belief uh, in the tradition of the Pharisees, that a general resurrection at the end of the age would come to pass, but Jesus brings it near. Jesus brings it close. He ushers the end uh, of the end of the day into the present hour and he personalizes the reality owning it for himself which is the outrageous claim of a psychopath or a legitimate statement of fact he says i am resurrection and i am life now if that weren't challenging enough to consider here's another real mystery and here's the beauty and agony the joy and sorrow the potential and tragedy of being human it comes in waves Mary, John reports, rushes toward Jesus, falls at his feet weeping. John describes it like this. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. And then John says, Jesus wept. The weeping of Martha and Mary in the crowd is described in the Greek as klio. It denotes an outward form of sobbing and crying, but John uses a different word to describe the weeping of Jesus. It is endocrizen, which is the image of a silent tear streaming down the face of Jesus, the Son of God weeping for the hopeless, faithless, broken human situation. Whatever you want to say about the God revealed in Scripture, you can't say He's not there, or I can't see Him, or I can't relate to Him, or he's unconcerned for me. The answer to Joan Osborne's 1995 hit song, What If God Were One of Us, that asks with these lyrics, what if God were one of us, just a slob like one of us, just a stranger on the bus trying to make his way home, is that God was one of us and stood with us in the grief of death. He knows human, but Jesus hasn't come solely to relate. He's come to liberate the captives to open eyes, to heal the sick, to bring good news to the poor, and yes, even to raise the dead. They went to Lazarus's tomb. He's been there four days. Jesus orders the stone to be rolled away. Martha warns of the stench of death. Jesus prays to the Father in front of the crowd, saying, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cries out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips, his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. The late theologian, missionary, and bishop Leslie Newbegin sums up the meaning of this sign for us with these powerful words, quote, perhaps one may dare to say only this, that the immediate presence of death and of the hopeless unbelief of his friends in the face of death, Jesus was facing that power which he has come to destroy, a power which is met by the wrath of him who is the author of life, but which could only be cast out when the author of life took the whole power of death upon himself, close quote. Lazarus's resurrection was temporary, of course, meaning that it wasn't the final resurrection to life eternal. He would die a natural death someday, but it was the signal. It was the display of God's glory and a forecast of what was soon to come as the Passover drew closer and Jesus would make his way toward Jerusalem uh, and facing the power of death and his own righteous death on the cross, which would destroy the power of death and actually inaugurate the presence of the age to come into this present age a resurrection reality at work in us now. More on this in the weeks to come. But for now, but for now, human, that God invested to the level of sorrows, of pain and all of our confusion, that God entered into them personally, human. He must love indeed the world that he made. And if you're weeping this day, you don't weep alone. And if you're human and you struggle to believe in a world that could live again, a life that could be born again, a redemption that indeed could make all things new, 
then remember this. Remember Jesus. Remember He came for you. And hear these words, Lazarus, come out. And you might as well do this. You might as well insert your own name for Lazarus and shout it out loud. Jesus is indeed the resurrection and the life. Thanks be to God. Amen. Lord, have mercy, Christ, have mercy, our cry, and heal our Let kindness lead us to repentance, bring us back again. For your name is great and your heart is great. Carry your lays on over all your reign, you alone can say. Carry your lays on. Lord have mercy. Christ have mercy on us now. believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, 
the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Well, all right, friends, thank you so much for being a part of our online worship experience today from wherever you're connecting. Whenever you're connecting with this, we're so glad you've done so. And our prayer for you is simple, the love of Christ over your life. God's richest blessings to you today. And if this has been a blessing for you to connect with us with our online worship experience, I want to encourage you, be a digital missionary with us. Share this service link with a friend, with a neighbor, a coworker, or with your social feed. We really do appreciate that. There's so many ways to connect with us here at SJC. If you're in the Wilmington area, we want to invite you to join us in person for worship. We would love to meet you. We gather Sundays, 8.30, 10 a.m., kids ministry going strong all morning long. And at 9.15, it's bagels, coffee, community connection, conversations, and new friends. Again, plan your visit. You can go to our website, get more information about what it's like on campus and in person with us here at St. John's. We look forward to meeting you. So many ways that you can connect with us and grow in your relationship with Jesus. Um, Easter and Holy Week are coming up. I want to invite you to click the link, uh, go to the link at the bottom of the screen, uh, read all about our Holy Week and Easter offerings. It all kicks off next Sunday with our Palm Sunday worship gatherings and, and observances. So join us for that either online or in person. You can find out more information there. And partnership is just so huge. Time, treasure, talent coming together. Our response to the gospel our response to the love of God in Christ is what we say stewardship is all about. It's about giving our lives in gratitude to Jesus and in service for his kingdom. So many people doing so many uh, things behind the scenes, in front of the house, uh, you name it. It's all over the place and we are so excited to partner together uh, to bring good news to our Wilmington community and beyond. And we invite you to be a part of that with us. One of the simple ways is to become a financial partner with us, to become a sustaining giver. You can learn more about giving by going to our website, click the giving button in the top right corner and read uh, and learn more about how you can become a financial partner with us. All gifts, large and small, uh, they add up to help us make a difference in the lives of others. May God build in us hearts of generosity. He's been so, so good to us. Let us serve the Lord with gladness. God bless you today in your giving. Just an amazing account from John's gospel, the raising of Lazarus. It's the seventh sign in the book of John and John's gospel. And it is a forecast and a foreshadow of Jesus's own resurrection, but it shows and demonstrates Jesus's power and authority, his authority even over death itself. Jesus destroys death through his own death on the cross. We'll come to that in the coming weeks. It's been a joy to be together today with you. We're so honored by your presence and we want to stay connected with you. You can find us anywhere and everywhere on social media at S-J-C-I-L-M. Hope you'll connect with us there. And remember as you go today, Jesus loves you. He really, really does. And friends, life is short. We don't have much time to gladden the hearts of those who travel with us. So let us be swift to love and make haste to be kind. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Until next time, everybody. Take care.